Hello, welcome back. Boy, it's good to have you in on this class on the plain gospel. We're talking about the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. And uh, if you have the workbook that goes along with this class, that would be a great advantage. I encourage you to open that to chapter 6. We'll be there in a moment. We're going to be in Galatians. More important than anything, if you can have a Bible open in front of you to Galatians chapter 1, you'll get so much more out of it if you'll follow along and look at the Bible in, uh, at your own Bible and kind of see what side of the page it's in that will help you to remember the verses. I'm really excited about this series. Uh, there's just uh, so much neat stuff about what the Bible says about the gospel. And I'm so glad to, to get to the core of the gospel like we did in the last class with 1 Corinthians. This time we're going to talk about Galatians when the gospel is not the gospel. I think before long you're going to understand that title. So getting right into it, point A, the first thing that we're going to bring out is we're going to talk about deserting the gospel. little background here, Paul was, he had started the churches in Galatia. Uh, Galatia is not a town, it is a region. There were several churches there, uh, Lystra and Iconium, Iconium and Derby were all in the region of Galatia, and Paul had worked with those churches in Acts chapter 14. But he had heard that there were problems after he'd already passed on, and he was all the way up in Corinth working there. He'd heard that there were problems back in Galatia, and so he writes this, which what we believe to be his very first letter that he ever wrote that's recorded in the New Testament, in about 50 A.D., and notice what he says. We'll skip the preliminary stuff in the first five verses, and we'll jump in here at chapter 1, verse 6, as we look at point 1, how sad that the Galatians were already turning to a different gospel. Read this with me in verse 6, if you would. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you, I want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. It was sad that these Galatians in these churches in the region of Galatia had heard the gospel not long before this. But some others had come in behind Paul, and they were altering the gospel. They were teaching a different gospel. And when he says, I'm amazed, let me translate that for you. The modern version would be, I'm blown away. I can't believe you're doing this. I'm just astonished that so quickly you would desert the gospel. And you're not just deserting the gospel. Point number two, preaching a different gospel is the same as deserting God. Look at verse 6. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ. Who called you by the grace of Christ? God the Father. He called you by His grace, and you're deserting that for a different gospel? Paul is very upset with the Galatians, and rightfully so. And he's making the same point that we've been making in this class from the very beginning. You don't alter, you don't change the gospel. There's only one gospel, and when you change it, 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 it's not another. Point number three, a distorted gospel is not even gospel because it's no longer good news. If you change it, then we're not being saved the way the Bible says to be saved, which means we're not saved. That's not good news. There is only one gospel. And let me take a side note here and say there are not four gospels. I was had a Bible study with a dear friend this week, and I was telling him about I was going to be recording these classes for BibleTalk.tv, and I was excited. And he said, well, what's your class is going to be in? And I said, well, the gospel. He said, oh, well, which one? And what he means is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call the four gospels. The Bible never uses gospels as plural unless it's referring to false gospels. There's really only one gospel. I I wish I could break us of that habit of saying that. The better way to say it is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four accounts of the gospel. I taught Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
as uh, synoptic books, meaning they're very similar, and we taught it as the synoptic gospel, not the synoptic gospels, because there is only one gospel. And if you distort it, if you change it in any way, it's not gospel, it's not good news anymore. Which brings us to our fourth point. A tainted gospel, notice it is disturbing, it's even destructive to those who listen to it. Verse 7, he says, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you, want to distort the gospel of Christ. It is disturbing, it is destructive to the church. It's destructive to Christianity when we alter or change the gospel. So the first thing that I hope we get from this lesson is don't ever desert, don't ever change the gospel. Point B, let's talk about the curse of man-made gospels a little bit here. Number one under that, there is a curse on anyone who alters the plain gospel. Look again at verse 8. Let's read it again. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he's to be accursed. As we said before, so now I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. Paul says, I don't care if, if, if it was us. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven came down and said, this is the gospel. You don't change it. You don't accept anything but the truth of the gospel. Second point that he makes here, number two, when pleasing man becomes more important than pleasing God, notice the plain gospel is going to get distorted. Too much politics. Politics has no place in the church. We're not here for politics. We're not here to please people. Oh, it's wonderful when people are pleased with what we do, but that's never the goal. When we are so concerned, well, maybe we shouldn't preach this quite so hard because some people don't like it. Well, boo-hoo. <laughs> that's, that's a shame. The fact is, we have, we're obligated to preach the gospel just the way the Bible says. And if some people don't believe that baptism is necessary to salvation and we preach that, we don't do it to offend people. I don't ever want to offend anybody, but I'm certainly not going to change, not going to alter what the Bible says. Are we too concerned about pleasing people? When pleasing man is more important to us than pleasing God, the gospel is going to get distorted. Third point I want to make is that any gospel that comes from a man is really not a true gospel. It goes on in verse 11. We're still staying in Galatians chapter 1. It says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel, and notice it's one gospel, which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, that, Paul says, I, I'm not just preaching something that a man taught me. No, Jesus taught me this. He gave me this revelation. He revealed this gospel to me. And this is the one that I am preaching. We need to make sure it doesn't get altered in any way. All right, third point here. The gospel's original intention. Why do we have the gospel? What's it for? Let's take a look at that. Number one, the truth of the gospel must always remain with the church. We'll get into chapter 2 a little bit here. Look at the, the fourth verse of Galatians chapter 2. It says, But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. You may remember I, I stated earlier that there were some people who were following Paul around, who were changing the gospel, saying, well, you know, Paul said this, but uh, did he tell you about circumcision? Well, you got to make sure you get circumcised. And, and are you keeping the law? Yeah, you got to make sure you keep the law. And they were adding to, distorting it. They're stepping in changing the gospel. So that's what's bringing all this about. And Paul is writing to address that. Verse 5, 
but we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. He's talking to the churches in Galatia. It needs to remain with you. But from those who were on high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. This gospel... He says, there's people that came in and they tried to distort this, and we didn't even listen to them for an hour. We, we gave them nothing, uh, uh, no credibility at all. And I don't care how high their reputation is. He says, it doesn't matter. What they're teaching is false, and we need to make sure that you, the truth of the gospel needs to remain with you. And he's talking to the church. It needs to remain with the church. The church keeps this gospel. We've been in verse 7, entrusted with the gospel. It says, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to take it to the uncircumcised. Uh, Paul was sent by, by Christ himself to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been working with those who were Jews. Number two, it is because of the gospel that we're expected to treat brethren like brethren. Let me explain that. Starting in verse 11, it says, But when Cephas, and that's Peter, if you don't know, when, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing, and it's always fear, isn't it? fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? What had happened was when Cephas, Peter, and Paul were working with these Gentiles, the non-Jews, he was in fellowship with them, he was just fine. But then some Jewish brethren came along and he noticed that Peter was, was pulling back from the Gentiles. And Paul called him on it. He said, you're, you're in the wrong for doing this. And he, he chastises him about, says, you're, you're a Jew, but you're living like a Gentile. And he says, you know, uh, how is it that you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? It's almost like he's saying, you know what, Peter, you never were a very good Jew. Now, Paul was. Paul was a Pharisee. If anybody had a problem with fraternizing or, or spending time with the Gentiles, it should have been Paul, not Peter. But Peter was the one who was pulling back. And he says, that's wrong. And let me tell you why it's wrong. Because it hinders the truth of the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just a doctrine. It's not just uh, the things that we believe. It impacts the way we treat each other as brethren, as brothers in Christ. You either are my brother or you're not my brother today because of the gospel. I am your brother or I'm not your brother based on the gospel. The gospel determines all of that. And that's why the gospel is so important. This is the original intention of the gospel. Third thing I want to show you is that through scripture, the gospel was preached to Abraham. Now look at chapter 3 in Galatians and verse 6. Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Abraham believed, and that was credited to him as righteousness. This is a quote from, from the Old Testament. And so he says, we are sons of Abraham through faith. In fact, 
the gospel goes all the way back to Abraham. And you see a scripture like this that it says the scripture, notice what preached the gospel, the scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. And we're thinking, okay, how is that possible? The gospel was really the good news about salvation through Christ the Messiah. How did Abraham get connected with this? Let me share something with you about the way that I study and a mistake that I see a lot of my brothers and sisters making in their study of the text. When we come across a passage that maybe we don't understand very well, like verse 8, our tendency is to run to a commentary and see what the commentary says. Now, I have to be really careful I state this because I've been accused of, of, being, of hating commentaries. I don't dislike commentaries. I dislike the way we use them. Because what happens is, if you don't understand a text and you just immediately just jump to a commentary, if you've been taught the same thing that the person who wrote the commentary was taught, and it, if it happens to be wrong, you can't tell because you're just, you're just seeing what somebody else says. That's what it says. Let me show you a better way to do that. If you will take different translations of the Bible, and most of us have several translations. If not, if you have online sources, there are Bible programs and, and Bible search uh, uh, places, uh, downloads, where you can look at many different translations of the same verse. I'm going to show you on the screen here 12 translations of Galatians 3.8, and I want you to just read them with me and see if you can understand what verse 8 means. All right, the first one is the American Standard Version. It says, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Okay, that's the first one. You kind of get an idea? The Bible in basic English puts it this way. And the holy writing, seeing before the event that God would give the Gentiles righteousness by faith, gave the good news before to Abraham, saying, In you will all the nations have a blessing. Here's the easy to read version. The scriptures told what would happen in the future. These writings said that God would make the non-Jewish people right through their faith. God told this good news to Abraham before it happened. God said to Abraham, I will use you to bless all the people of the earth. Here's the contemporary English version. Long ago, the scripture said that God would accept the Gentiles because of their faith. That's why God told Abraham the good news, that all nations would be blessed because of him. The Christian Standard Bible says, Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and proclaimed the gospel ahead of time to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed through you. The English Standard Version says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Here's the International Standard Version. Because the scripture saw ahead of time that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, it announced the gospel to Abraham beforehand when it said, Through you all the nations will be blessed. The New Living Translation. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. Here's the, the old reliable King James. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the, the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Are you starting to get an idea of, of what this verse is saying? Here's the New King James Version. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, and you all the nations shall be blessed. And then the New International Readers Version says, long ago scripture knew that God would make non-Jews right with himself by believing in him. He announced the good news ahead of time to Abraham he said, all nations will be blessed because of you. And then finally, the New International Version, the 1984 
uh, version says, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. Now these translations that I've used, uh, let me first of all explain that I don't even really uh, like some of these translations and I don't recommend them to others. But I've found that even uh, translations that I don't think are as uh, conservative to the text or as consistent in their translation, even those don't get every verse wrong. And on some of these, I've found that it's, it's actually quite insightful. And so grab several translations Look at the verse, wrestle with the text first before you turn to a commentary or before you even ask or, or believe what I say or any other man says. What does the text say? And when you use different translations, you're seeing, well, what does God actually say? What, is, what was the intent of the original language? If you can't study Koine Greek, if you, don't, if you are, are not a Greek scholar, and I'm not, then translations, English translations, will help you. After you wrestle with text, if you want to turn to a commentary and confirm and, and see if that's what others are thinking, well, great, that's fine. But let me encourage you to wrestle with the text. This text is saying that Abraham received the gospel long ago. And the reason we know that is because he was told, Genesis 12, 3, 18, 18 and 22, 18, several times he was told this, all nations will be blessed because of you. All nations, which means more than just the Jews. Even long, long ago, we see a glimpse of this good news, this gospel was being shared even with Abraham. Whether Abraham realized it or not is irrelevant. He did receive the gospel message. And that's what the verse is saying. All right. Last point here. The gospel unites us by clothing us with Christ. Still in chapter 3 of Galatians, look at verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One of the most beautiful things about the gospel is how it unites us, how it brings us together as a team. You ever been in a, a restaurant and a, a team comes, maybe a softball or, or baseball or football team, or, and you can tell they're a team because they're all wearing the same uniform. Well, in Christ, if I have been baptized and I've been clothed with Christ, and that's when it says that we're clothed with Christ, according to verse 27, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. If that's happened to me and that's happened to you, and I see you, well, we're wearing the same uniform. We're on the same team. That's the beauty of the gospel is it unites us. That's the gospel's original intent. It brings us together as a family of God, as God's kingdom. Whether you are here in Oklahoma or you're on the other side of the world, it doesn't matter. We're still wearing the same uniform. We're on the same team because we are clothed with Christ. I hope you understand now when the gospel is not the gospel. I hope you also understand why it is so important that we fervently hold on to and never relinquish what the truth of the gospel is. Man, if you enjoyed this class, I think you're really going to enjoy the next one because the next one we're going to be in Ephesians and we're going to talk about the plain saving gospel. We'll see you then.